Good. Ah, oh, yes. Well, uh, thank you, everyone, for attending, and thank you to the first two speakers. So, what I'd like to talk about is just a little bit about some work I've done with computer generated art. So, there's a little bit of a gallery growing outside my office, and this work fits into a paradigm of artist critic co evolution or adversarial training. So, you have an artist generating images, you have a critic who's trained to tell the difference between real images and the ones generated by the artist. And then the artist is trained either by back gradient descent or by evolution to produce images that will fool the critic into thinking that they are real. So it was Marcel Duchamp who first highlighted the role of the critic in the artistic process. He called it the spectator. But in the early work on computer generated art, usually a human played the role of the critic. So 15 images would appear on the screen. The user would select the ones they like and they would go into the next generation. So you have this blind watchmaker biomorphs from 1986 and then some more sophisticated genetic programs, 1991. And then you get to the compositional pattern producing networks, 2011. Uh, but then people started to ask, well, can we replace the human critic with a automated critic? And there were a few earlier attempts to do this, but the first people who really got it to work were these uh, generative adversarial networks, this good fellow 2014. And with the GANs, the artist and the critic are both neural networks, and you actually back propagate. The, the gradient from the critic through the image and into the artist. And GANs are normally used to make realistic images, but they've also been used for art. But what happens with the GANs is you, you, you have to have thousands, you collect a, thousands of uh, human artworks and you feed them to the GAN and then it tries to mimic the style of the human artist. And so our motivation for this work, we decided we wanted to keep the neural network for a critic because that's definitely the best choice. But we wanted, it's also interesting to explore different kinds of artists rather than a neural network because different artists produce different styles of image. So that was one motivation. And the other thing is we wanted to train our system not on existing artworks, but purely on photographs because we didn't want it to mimic an existing uh, artistic style. Instead, its own artistic style emerges as a trade-off between, on the one hand, trying to create an image that will fool the critic into thinking it's real, uh, but on the other hand, there's pressure to create an image of low computational uh, complexity. So the art emerges from that trade-off. And this is some of the early images uh, we created with this process. So the artist is it's a special kind of genetic program. It takes in a X and Y coordinate and produces uh, red, green, and blue intensities. And the thing works, uh, it's kind of a back and forth thing. So you have an evolutionary process that goes on. The artist is trying to create an image that will fool the current critic. And at the end of that process, whatever the best image that's emerged goes into a gallery. And then the next critic is trained to reject all of the existing images in the gallery. So the system kind of chugs away, producing one image every two minutes or so. And after some few days, it produces, you know, 600 or 1,000 images and then a human at the end can scan through and pick the ones they like. And this is the advantage of using in a working in a visual medium rather than audio. It's, uh, it doesn't take too long to scan through uh, a thousand images and pick ones that you like. But if you ask someone to listen to a thousand pieces of music one after the other, uh, they might lose their sanity. So then we moved on to kind of um, landmarks. So this is, you know, different versions of the, of the Eiffel Tower coming from an evolutionary process. And for this Evo Musart paper, we collected photographs of um, 10 famous landmarks. And another advantage of this, you don't need thousands of images for this. You only need perhaps between about 
20 and 80 pictures of each landmark. So we picked out the 10 landmarks. And what's, what's interesting about this is that uh, the artist comes up with its own style, but we can sometimes recognize existing artistic styles in what emerges. So we see kind of minimalism. We see uh, sometimes like fauvism with very vibrant colors and sharp contrasts. We see abstraction. Uh, sometimes it comes up with a kind of figurative rendition of an object rather than a realistic one. So, I, you know, he, this thing looks like a kite or a or a totem pole, but it's, it was supposed to be the Taj Mahal somehow. And uh, this was supposed to be a, a, a cathedral, but looks a bit different. Uh, you often get kind of fractal art. So this image here is based on the Golden Gate Bridge. It reminds us a little bit the work of MC Escher. You know, these, these pylons kind of disappear into the distance and you can't quite see where the sky ends and the water begins. Uh, you also get see pointillism somehow. So this is meant to be, this is based on the Great Pyramid. And if you zoom into this, you can see just like fantastic detail. It's like a huge desert when you can see the individual grains of sand. It's this, it's kind of a matter of personal taste, but I particularly like this one, you know, you can't really see what this is, but it's like, there's some empty space here and some kind of structure here and it's reflected in the water. It's made up of little points. You also see metaphor. So like I said, a cathedral may be, look like a flower, a tree may look like an insect, a bridge may look like some scarves hanging on the line and, and so on. And you often get with this process repeated substructures, but with slight variations. So it gives the image a kind of natural look, sometimes as if it emerged from a, from a kind of natural process. Uh, and also with this uh, system, the artist is able to kind of reuse material, genetic material from previous uh, things in the gallery. So you sometimes see a kind of uh, progression where it's kind of, developed its ideas and changed things along the way. And uh, these are just a few images that we generated afterwards that didn't quite make it into the paper. So this is based on this hotel in Dubai with Burj Al Arab. Um, this is, uh, yeah, like looks like a cosmic flower. <laughs> these ones are based on water lilies. These are kind of the most realistic looking images from the process. And you, sometimes you get these sort of rather crazy structures. And this one, I like to think of this one as if it's like a self-portrait of the AI, you know, the, I like to think of this as the self-portrait of the AI artist <laughs> sitting at its desk and making an image of it self. Yeah. So, it's just a very quick introduction and if you're interested you can go and have a look at this website you'll see a lot more details thanks alan uh do we if there's any questions we could put them in the chat so when's your first exhibition going to be <laughs> uh yeah that would be a good idea <laughs> Great. Um, well, um, in the interest of time, I think we're going to move on. Um, we're we're um, just about on, on schedule, but we're desperately short of falling behind schedule. We're going to move now to um, uh, our emeritus professor, Paul Compton, who was also previously head of school. It's wonderful to, to see Paul around, um, if only virtually. Um, and he's going to tell us about all the exciting work that he's been doing with Ripple Down Rules. Um, and how everything isn't just machine learning, despite what you hear about in the media. So over to you, Paul. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Toby, for the chance to talk about this, this book. I'll just share my screen.
Okay. The cover of the book looks a bit like this. It's going to be published by Taylor and Francis under their CRC Press imprint, and it's, it's coming out in March ne next year. The, um, hold on, this is coming out in March next year. Uh, it'll look like this, except my beautiful graphics being redone by a graphic artist. Now, what it's going to cover is limitations of machine learning, um, why ripple down rules, but the bulk of the book is worked examples on three of the major types of RDR with about 100 screenshots based on demo software available on my CSE homepage, uh, which to make very accessible, I foolishly wrote in VBA for Excel. People will know why that was foolish. Um, there's also a discussion of implementation issues such as validation and how you combine machine learning and ripple down rules. And there are two appendices describing applications. Uh, but why is a book on ripple down rules uh, needed? The first appendix um, outlines the various MDR, industry RDR I'm aware of. Now this looks a pretty impressive industry impact, but it's, it's, it's largely an illusion because only one of these um, discovered RDR through the literature. All the others had an RDR advocate uh, <clears throat> with prior experience at RDR and connecting back to UNSW. And it's about six of them, my co-author has been the advocate. But why do RDR need a, an advocate? The, the problem is that RDR are too simple to be interesting to smart researchers, while at the same time they're counterintuitive and people tend to assume they must be doing something different from what they actually do. And Ashwin Srinivasan, responsible for IBM's use of RDR, has been telling me for years the solution to this is that RDR needs a manual rather than research papers, uh, and so hence this book. So what actually is, is RDR? Here we've got a machine learning problem. You want to distinguish the, the, the red and the green objects. But let's first of all point out that only in research land do you get pre-labeled data. Mostly you've got to label the data first, but let's assume it's labeled. Let's try a simple model to distinguish the cases. Works not too bad, but some errors. We try a fancier model, works better. And then we try a very fancy model, and it's, it's wonderful, and we developed this marvelous algorithm. But when we put it into use, along comes a case that it doesn't work on. So what do we do? Do we start again? Ripple Down Rules has a, a different approach. It says, well, here's this case that I've got a label. So as well as labeling it, why don't I write a rule? In this case, the simple rectangular model. And I start running this system, and it's, it's working pretty well, classifying cases. Oh, but it makes an error. So why don't I write a rule that re refines the first green rule? But now, I don't straight away get a perfect rule. I might write that, first of all. But I'll be told that this misclassifies the case on which I base the first rule. So I, I narrow it. And this asking the user to distinguish between cases with different classifications is a key part of it. Anyway, I keep running. Add another refinement rule, add a rule extending it, add another refinement rule, another extension rule, and one final extension rule. Um, and what I've done is I've added seven rules, seven simple rules. But note, I've got virtually the same coverage of the domain as my much more sophisticated algorithm. And of course, when the problem case comes along, I just write another rule. Now, does it as work as well as this in practice? This is a 3,000 rule knowledge base, and the, the vertical axis of the time in blue, the time to add and debug a rule, and that's the total time. So it includes, its actual raw data includes going to get coffee, going to the bathroom, etc. So the red line is the median time over the, the last uh, 50 cases, 50 rules. And you can see it's about a minute or two uh, to add a rule. Now, this was done gradually over, over eight years. And the total time of some of the blue dots, you know, it's just hours per, per year. And the first thing we might comment is that the, <coughs> the, the, the person building this was happy to 
to keep on um, to keep on adding rules. And I ended up with a very sophisticated system. It provides 253 different comments, but it gives these in combinations, so potentially thousands of different comments. And it, in this period, it processed you know, 7.3 million reports. Now, what are these reports? Um, if we have a, if we have a look at uh, this, uh, this is the standard pathology report with results for biochemical parameters. The key thing down here is the the comment given by the pathologist or by an RDR system, and it says it's consistent with renal impairment, but it says potassium is disproportionately high for that re renal impairment. It notes there's no evidence of medication, so the pathologist suggests the medications, and it. The pathology side, this is a bit of a tricky case, maybe it should be referred to a specialist. Now, there are about 800 different knowledge bases in use like this for different subdomains developed by end user pathologists with the largest 16,000 rules. So clearly pathologists are happy to keep on building these rules. But I guess a key question is, um, why not use machine learning? The reason you can't use machine learning this sort of, these sorts of very refined comments um, just don't exist in the real world. There have been lots of papers saying machine learning is going to take over clinical chemistry because of the probably billions of such reports in databases. But if we actually look, there's very few papers and they're on <coughs> very small, well curated data sets with just much more limited classifications than these subtle cl classifications that people uh, use in, in practice. Okay, another example of an RDR system. IBM had a data cleansing project on Indian street address uh, data. Apparently Indian street address data is very inconsistent. And this project used RDR, a decision tree and a conditional random field approach and trained on Mumbai data and tested on Mumbai data, the methods are pretty comparable. But tested on all India data, the RDR degrade much less than the machine learning methods, as obviously humans know about addresses in general. Now, clearly if you provided more training data, the machine learning would do better, but you've got to label it. So why not rules that write rules at the same time? And it's worthwhile noticing the researchers who did this got an IBM award for research leading to $10 million of a new business. And I believe this is now part of IBM's data cleansing toolkit. But rather than contrasting machine learning and ripple down rules as I've been suggesting, why not combine them? That was our simple model of how you build an RDR system. And just looking at what that is, it's you run a program, and if the output's incorrect, you add a rule to give the correct output instead, you override the other output. Or if the output's missing, you add a rule to give the appropriate output. And the rule might actually run another program. And, and obviously this is a recursive definition because each time you add another, a rule to the program, uh, you've got a new program. Now let's have a look at an application of this. Uh, the duplicate invoices, they're estimated at one to two percent of all payments. Uh, SAP's got a wonderful duplicate detection, duplicate invoice detection system that detects them all. But there's about 92 percent false positives that have to be checked, so they have to be checked through by account clerks. Putting an RDR wrapper, as I've just described, around this, and reviewing 4,800 cases, 50 rules are added. The false positives dropped to 19% as tested on unseen test cases. But this looks terrible. You'd have to look at 4,800 cases. But the account clerks had to look at this anyway because these are all flagged as, as duplicate invoices, but most of them were false. So just writing 50 rules during that process at a minute or two per rule, they reduced their workload by, by 80%. So, this sort of RDR wrapper, it can be used with any programming, processing data case by case, whether it's machine learning uh, or whatever. Now, I've only had time to, to do a quick sales job on Ripple Down Rules, and there are obviously all sorts of major questions that I haven't covered, but hopefully they're covered in the book out in March. 
Uh, and if anyone is very desirous of finding out the answers earlier, uh, contact me and I can send you a, um, I, I, I can send you a preprint. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, we've got one quick question. I know we're running behind time, but I'm going to ask the question from the chat, which um, someone's asking about the exp expressivity of um, the rules that you can add. Can you add arbitrary constraints or are they restricted to some, um, some, some simple um, linear combination, axis parallel lines in some hyperplane? So how complex are the constraints you can put into the... Uh, you can... I'm probably not understanding this 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 question. I think are they just simple linear combinations of features, or are they more complex logical <laughs> operators you, you can put in there? You can you can have more com more complex uh, combinations of features. Yes, right. is a short answer. And and this, this the, the 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 chapter in the book on what are called general ripple down rules covers this sort of topic. Great. Okay. Well. Um, look out for the book and in the future we're all looking forward um, to seeing the book and it's, and it's wonderful to see um, that uh, AI isn't just machine learning and, and that some of these things that you've been working on for how many years now, Paul, dare I ask? Quite a few, quite a few. Quite a few, quite a few years. That's a, that's a, that's a, a wonderfully um, qualitative answer to a quantitative question. Um, are finding a useful application. And I, I, will, I will disagree with one thing you said which is um, surely the best form of knowledge transfer is the knowledge transfer in people's heads. And that's really one of the most important things that university does as much as generate new knowledge is to fill young heads with that knowledge and then send those heads out into industry. Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> great, thank you very much, Paul. Um, now I've got the great honor of introducing myself. Um, so I'm gonna be talking very quickly about um, my latest new project on trustworthy artificial intelligence. So let me just put the slides up. Uh, uh, one second. Too many windows now. Uh, and the, some, some of the talks we've already heard today have been a fantastic introduction. Mary Ann's talk um, at the start um, and, and Paul's talk as well just now were wonderful examples of um, both the need for building more trustworthy AI uh, and also some of the tools like um, ripple down rules, which are um, a beautiful example of uh, a technology that we have within AI that, um, that uh, allows for, for nice, simple, intuitive explanations. Um, as as Mary Ann was talking about, uh, I do think we're, we're running into a real trust gap here as AI starts to invade our lives uh, and is very much a hidden part of many aspects of our lives. Many people don't realize how much AI is behind all of the tech giants. Every time you get a 30% of the content that people watch on Netflix are things that the AI recommended they watch. Uh, many of the purchases that people make on Amazon are the things that the recommended system recommended. Um, every time that you use Google Translate, there's um, some deep learning that's doing the translating. So there's, there's a huge amount of, and every time you ask Siri a question, there's, there's um, um, machine learning that's, that's doing the speech recognition and, um, and so on. So there's a huge amount of AI that's starting to take, uh, to take over in our lives. Um, and some of that AI is having significant impacts. And we only have to look at some, I mean, it wasn't really even AI, it was very simple um, algorithms uh, and the disastrous impacts they have. Um, everyone in Australia will have read about um, robo debt um, and the consequences of that, and that it's um, costing the government a huge amount of money to, um, and there's a huge amount of harm uh, done to people um, by the misuse of, of, of some rather stupid algorithms in that case. But we see that in many other examples. Um, we've already heard face recognition discussed today, um, and there are plentiful, worrying, troubling uses of face recognition, we only have to look at, for example, what's happening in China today, the persecution of the Uyghurs, uh, face recognition being used in part to do that, so to realize um, some of the tro troubling applications um, that AI is being put to. Um, one that I think is, is, a, is a recipe for disaster waiting for a class action suit to happen is the increasing use of, of AI um, in human resources, in recruitment. Um, companies uh, are receiving large numbers of CVs, 
um, is starting to use AI to help them select out a small number of people to call for interview. Um, and as Marianne was mentioning, uh, one of the real challenges is, is the biases that, well, of course, humans had biases in that process of selecting people to call for interview, but, but um, building AI systems that don't perpetuate or even exaggerate some of those biases is a real, is a real, real significant challenge. So if we're going to build systems, there are definitely lots of interesting technical questions that, that um, I've started to look at and colleagues have started to look at in terms of what is it that we need to build um, trustworthy systems. It's not one feature. Um, it's things like fairness, explainability that, that Marianne uh, rightly focused on. Uh, we want to build systems that we can audit. Um, that, that, um, that are robust, um, systems that are very brittle, uh, we're not going to put much trust in, systems that we can verify, there's a lot of work going on within uh, UNSW on verifying uh, systems behavior. So there's a huge number of technical aspects to building trustworthy AI systems. Um, but I would emphasize, of course, it's not just technical challenges that we face in trying to build trustworthy systems. There, it, it's a, it, there are lots of socio-political um, aspects to this as well that we shouldn't ignore um, and I do spend a lot of my time um, talking to politicians, talking to people in human rights organizations, talking to people um, in broader society because of that um, and we certainly are waking up to the idea that we will need to think about regulation, uh, we will need to think and we are starting to see um, politicians actually realize the important role that they have um, to regulate. There's lots of discussion, rightly so, in terms of um, how we um, constrain the tech giants these days. Um, we are seeing interesting regulation being, being brought into play, uh, especially within Europe, things like the general data protect, protection regulation, uh, the platform regulation that's coming up. But, but equally, we're seeing um, politicians here in Australia also uh, wake up to their responsibilities, wake up to some of these important conversations. I mean, there's a really important component of that, of course, is also education, which is um, we need a broader understanding within society, these are decisions about what sort of society we want it to be, uh, what sort of rules we, uh, we, we build, uh, what sort of technology we build. Um, and it's important that all of society is involved in those conversations. Um, and that does require, there's an important piece there in terms of um, education so people understand that this isn't magic, that some of the things that maybe Hollywood would have led you to believe are, are incorrect um, and it's actually not um, super intelligent AI may be that we have to worry about, certainly in the near future, is actually the fact that we're giving responsibility to machines that aren't uh, capable enough yet um, and the consequences of that. Um, so I'm pleased to say that um, I've received significant funding recently from the AIC. I have an, uh, a laureate project that's beginning um, January the 1st next year. Um, it's got um, $3 million from the AIC, similar amount of funding that UNSW is putting into it. So we've We've got um, significant funds to employ a bunch of postdocs that we've um, been interviewing for recently um, and a, a large number of uh, PhDs. Um, we still have um, positions, so if anyone on this, uh, on this call is uh, looking to study a PhD in, in AI, please do get in touch. I'm always looking for good PhD students. We have plentiful money to support um, people um, to do PhDs uh, in this area. Uh, and I just want to give just to spend a couple of minutes uh, giving an example of the sorts of things, sorts of uh, focus that we have, sorts of technical approaches, just to, uh, based on an example that we worked, out, worked on a few years ago about um, one aspect of trust, which is how we, do, how we do things, how we make fair decisions. This is a problem um, with a very large, um, fast-moving consumer good cus cus company. It's one of the two largest bakers in Australia, Tip Top Bakeries. Um, they have very uh, large su supply chain problem. 20,000 customers they deliver bread to uh, most days, um, so over 600 vehicles delivering that bread. Um, they spend hundreds of millions of dollars each year on transport costs, and we were looking to help them optimize uh, their costs in their supply chain, uh, work out which of the customers were costing them too much money. Um, and we gave them, uh, this was a project uh, at the time, it was with Nikta and Data 61, um, tens of millions of dollars, five, five to 10% saving, depending on the particular region, whether it's New Zealand or, or uh, which part of Australia it was that we were working with, that were giving them significant savings on their, on their distribution costs. Um, and that was tens of millions of dollars uh, each year. It's worth pointing out those recurrent savings every year. Um, and that was um, pretty much 50% of their profit margin. So um, it's the only time I've worked on a project where um, the, I got message back, the CEO had said, 
do whatever the geeks tell you to do, which is a very pleasing situation to be in, um, but made a, a big difference to their bottom line. Also, it's worth pointing out, um, because those are recurrent savings, and those are also savings not just in money, but those were savings in fuel costs, and most of the distribution costs are fuel. So that's savings in CO2. So that's thousands of tons of CO2 every year that weren't being put up into the atmosphere and because we were routing the trucks more efficiently. Um, so we're looking at how do, you, if you've got a complex supply chain, you've got these 600 vehicles and all these different customers, how do you divide the cost between all these different customers on all the different routes? Um, now, of course, simple answer there is, well, just let's look at the marginal cost. What's the marginal cost of adding a new customer? Um, and that marginal costs don't really get you very far. So if we take a, a, a customer in the middle of the outback, um, so a customer delivering bread to the Birdsville Hotel, uh, one of the remotest parts of the Australian outback, imagine uh, we had just one customer in the Birdsville Hotel. Imagine the petrol station next door decided to take some bread as well. Now we have two customers. Well, the marginal cost uh, for each of those customers is zero. Well, but the actual cost is, of course, half the cost of driving out to the, the middle of nowhere. Um, so marginal costs don't quite, um, don't, don't quite capture exactly what you want to do. Um, and it turns out there's a beautiful piece of mathematics, actually one contributed to winning the Nobel Prize in, in economics um, to Lloyd Shapley, um, which is called the, Lloyd Shap uh, the Shapley value. It's a, it's a completely well-founded method to allocate costs. Um, and it's the, uh, it's the average marginal cost but averaged over every possible subset of cost customers. So this is the only mathematics I've got on my slides. Don't worry if you don't understand it. It's saying, well, look at all every possible subset of customers, and I look at the average marginal cost um, of adding a particular customer to that particular subset, um, average over all n factorial subsets, and that gives you the Shapley value. I said it's well-founded. It's incredibly principled, because if you ask for three axiomatic properties, and this is why we think it's fair, it's efficient, it takes all the costs, it doesn't leave some of the cost unallocated, it doesn't impose a tax, it doesn't allocate more than the total cost. It's efficient, it's anonymous, that's a pretty uh, basic fairness property. All customers are treated equally, so if we have two customers in the same place, with the same demands, then where they'll end up with the same costs. Um, and it's monotonic, um, a very simple uh, idea of monotonicity, which is if, if the overall cost went up, so if the cost of petrol went up, uh, the cost of diesel went up, so the cost of delivering went up, the overall fuel bill went up. No one's individual cost should go down. That would, that would be absurd if someone sounds that now ended up with a cheap, cheaper thing. Well, it turns out um, that this uh, allocation, the Shapley value, is the, is, um, satisfies these three axioms. In fact, it's the unique formula, unique mechanism for allocating cost that satisfies these particular axioms. So you can either accept those three axioms or throw out the Shapley value. Um, when we came at the problem, economists have looked at it, so they've pretty much stopped at that point. Of course, we're interested in what's the Shapley value in this supply network. Uh, there's a particular supply vehicle routing problem underneath this, and so you actually have to ask, well, how do you compute it? It's a, it's a big sum, it's an exponential sum, actually, all the over all possible subsets. Um, so it was actually quite easy for us to show that it's, it's MB hard, it's intractable to compute the Shapley value. But nevertheless, we still want to be able to compute it so we can allocate costs. So you can't just say, well, I'm sorry, it's, it's too hard to compute. Uh, we still need to be able to allocate costs. Um, and actually, it's worse than that. We were able to prove even coming up with a polynomial time approximation that was guaranteed to with any constant factor uh, was intractable. Um, unless under a, under a simple uh, as approximation, um, complexity guarantee, P not equals MP, which most people um, believe. Um, there was no polynomial time approximation. So hard to, hard to compute, hard even to approximate. But we still want to compute it. Um, so we did some, did, did some analysis, came up with a simple Monte Carlo sampling algorithm where you, instead of looking at all possible subsets, you just sample the subsets. So you could look at a small number of sam sam samples. And we were able to show that we could, doing that, we could compute solutions um, efficiently, nevertheless, that converged quite quickly to the, uh, the exact value. Um, so just to conclude, um, there's an example of how we could build uh, an AI mechanism that's fair to do this cost allocation, do it in a very principled way, um, an efficient way. There's lots of things that I could talk about, you know, about actually applying this to the real world problem, which actually introduces some really interesting, fresh research questions, which is, I haven't talked about the fact that orders come in different sizes, 
how do we do this fair allocation if we need to take into account the fact that different customers have different order sizes, have different delivery frequencies, some people we're delivering to every day, some people only once a week. Uh, what, if, what if we don't actually, as is the case, control the whole supply chain, but there are subcontractors who are, who are costing parts of the supply chain, how do we, how do we build those? So lots, lots of interesting things in that. So um, just to conclude, um, it's really lovely to work with um, people. So do, if you've got interesting problems like this, do approach us. We love to have people to come and visit. As I said, uh, we have plentiful funding for PhD students. Um, we love um, being inspired by industry's problems. So do, if you've got problems like this, uh, we'll be very happy to hear and see if we can help you out on them. Um, so that's enough for me. Um, and hopefully we've made up a bit of, a bit of time um, on the, um, on the on the question, so um, I'm going to now move over to the next talk. Um, so we're only five minutes behind schedule, uh, and ask my colleague Harris um, to talk some more about fairness uh, and some of the things that he's been looking at. Harris, over to you. Just trying to figure out the sharing. Is is it on? Yes, I believe it's on. All right. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, it's great to be here. So uh, today uh, uh, I'll be talking about uh, a super abridged version of my uh, AAAI senior member presentation that I made earlier in the year in February. It was my last uh, flight this year. So uh, fair division is a uh, well-established and classical field uh, with several books and uh, several several decades of work uh, done, especially within mathematical economics and social choice theory. And in the last few years, uh, there's been a lot of excitement uh, input, uh, which has been uh, brought via computer science. And if you see many of the major AI conferences, you'll see tutorial sessions, uh, workshops on uh, fair allocation problems, uh, including the ones which Toby mentioned about fair cost allocation in transport settings. So uh, just to give you a brief snapshot, this is uh, the splitted.org website, which uh, gives you a nice snapshot of uh, a lot of uh, real life, uh, daily life problems, which uh, um, can benefit from fair division uh, ideas and also uh, which have a lot of beautiful mathematics at the background. So um, more generally within AI as well, uh, there's been a wider movement, uh, which Anne-Marie uh, alluded to, uh, a movement for fairness, accountability, and transparency. Uh, a lot of the uh, mention of algorithmic fairness already goes towards machine learning, but as I'll mention in this presentation, uh, there are many other decision-making problems, uh, cost allocation problems, preference aggregation problems, uh, which can uh, significantly benefit by fairness considerations. Uh, also, uh, when you're making all these important decisions uh, and you hand these decisions to uh, computer algorithms, then uh, there are also some other aspects which come into play as well. Uh, Anne Mary, for example, mentioned about uh, diversity and representation issues as well. So, uh, in this particular presentation, I'll be focusing on one subclass of uh, fairness problems, which uh, I refer to as multi agent allocation problems. And one abstract definition one can come up with uh, for multi agent allocation problems is that you have a set of agents. Uh, you have a set of items, they might be divisible, they might be indivisible, and agents have uh, preferences or utilities over uh, these items. And the key question that, uh, that is often asked in uh, this field is how to allocate fairly. So this is where uh, uh, these fuzzy concepts such as fairness, you re really need to come up with concrete versions of this, uh, this concept. And uh, one quote, which was uh, nice, and I put it here, is that a compromise is the art of dividing a cake in such a way that everyone believes that he has a, uh, the biggest piece. So indeed, uh, this particular quote points to one fundamental uh, concept uh, of fairness, which is referred to as inner fairness, and it's uh, heavily used in many uh, fair allocation problems, such as rent division, uh, allocation of tasks, allocation of goods, and so on. And it simply requires that an agent should not envy another person's allocation. Uh, yet another fairness concept that is also highly influential, it's been around since uh, the 1940s, it was proposed by uh, famous mathematician Steinhaus, uh, is proportionality. And proportionality is a concept which puts a welfare bound on every agent's resultant utility. 
And uh, what is nice about this concept is that if you have additive utilities, then proportionality is a weaker version of Henry Freeness. In particular, Henry Freeness implies proportionality. So uh, when you're allocating indivisible items, indivisible goods, indivisible tasks, uh, the issue is that both these concepts, Henry Freeness and proportionality, uh, they may lead to situations where uh, no fair allocation exists. So should we just uh, forgo any semblance of fairness at that point, or should we still go for uh, some kind of fair allocation? And in this uh, line of work, two relaxations which have been highly influential in the last few years uh, were proposed by Eric Budish. One is called maximum fair share. It's a technical concept which I will not define. It's, you can view it as a pessimistic variant of proportionality. And yet another one is uh, called EF1 or Henry Freeness up to one item. And that is yet an another relaxation. And this time it's a relaxation of Henry Freeness. So as far as these concepts are concerned, uh, in 2014, there was a very influential paper by Prakash and Wang, uh, who showed that uh, although an allocation satisfying MMS fairness may not exist, they managed to get an approximation guarantee uh, that a two over three approximation of MMS fair allocation does exist. Since then, there's a lot of work, follow-up work on faster, simpler, better approximation algorithms for uh, MMS fairness. People have been trying to generalize the kind of utilities which can be handled, including some of our own work as well. And uh, this is an ongoing stream of work in which people have come up with a nice concept called MMS fairness, and they're trying to find better approximations of this particular concept. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there's also this concept called EF1, which essentially is a weakening of envy freeness, where you say that we're okay with some envy as long as that envy goes away if you remove one item from consideration, especially from the agent who is envious. So the nice aspect of uh, EF1 is that it can be uh, achieved by some very simple and widely used algorithms, in particular, the round robin sequential algorithm, which you might have used in your uh, school or recess when you're forming some teams. However, that particular algorithm, it's not guaranteed to additionally guarantee Pareto optimality. So natural question arose that uh, does there always exist an allocation which is EF1 and Pareto optimal? And uh, a few years back, uh, it turned out that it was shown that if you're trying to maximize the product of the utilities of the agents, uh, then you get both EF1 and Pareto optimal, uh, optimality. Uh, this particular approach uh, of maximizing the Nash product, it's, uh, it's nice, but it, uh, it's an NP-hard approach. So the, there's still an open question whether, uh, what is the complexity of finding an allocation which is both EF1 and Pareto efficient. Um, so this previous result that I mentioned was only for the case of goods, but obviously a lot of allocation problems are about allocation of tasks, which can be viewed as chores or uh, they can be viewed as agents getting negative utilities for getting those uh, items. And one particular approach that we took was that we came up with a general framework, which includes both goods and chores. And we showed that uh, for this more general framework, uh, there does exist uh, an efficient algorithm which computes an EF1 allocation. Uh, it's not guaranteed uh, to be Pareto efficient. And in fact, even the existence of an EF1 and Pareto optimal allocation is still uh, an open problem. So uh, what can we do in terms of uh, efficient algorithms? Well, one approach that we took was that instead of considering EF1, we considered a weakening, which is a weakening of proportionality, which we refer to as prop one. And we showed in, uh, in a different paper uh, that there's in fact an efficient algorithm a polynomial time algorithm which computes an allocation which is both prop one and for it optimal. So uh, all of these results that I've mentioned till now, uh, they refer to problems where there are no priorities of items over agents. It's just about allocating items to agents. You can also have some settings where items in fact have priorities over agents. And this is indeed the case when let's say uh, school seats are being uh, allocated to students and uh, schools may have priorities or merit-based priorities over which students they want to uh, select. In that case, there are some well-established concepts such as justified in freeness, which is a suitable uh, adaptation of in freeness for this setting with priorities. Uh, but uh, in the last few years, people have started considering more complex settings, in, in particular settings which involve diversity goals. 
And it turns out that a lot of two-sided matching theory, it breaks down uh, when you have these more complex distribution goals. And this is something which uh, my student, Zhao Hong, will uh, discuss in a bit more detail in the next presentation. Uh, I'll just mention a few uh, other application domains where fairness is also extremely important when you're making these decisions. Uh, one is portioning or fair mixing. That's uh, when you have the case where you have agents expressing preferences over various alternatives. And based on these preferences, you want to spread some budget or you want to spend some time. And this is something that uh, we covered uh, in, in the last couple of years. There was one HCAP paper from 2019 where this was heavily focused on. Um, normally, when you think about voting, uh, you, people normally think about presidential style voting where you're just selecting one president. And in that case, fairness is not, uh, you can't come up with too many meaningful fairness concepts because uh, decision making is highly majoritarian in spirit. On the other hand, if you're selecting many alternatives then you might try to think about catering for various minorities, you might want to care about proportional representation. And one setting where this is really applicable is multi-winner voting, where you might be selecting, say, not just one candidate, but you might be selecting multiple candidates. So in this space, uh, people have been trying to come up with not just new methods, uh, but also trying to conceptually uh, devise new axioms which capture these uh, fairness concerns, such as proportional representation, egalitarianism, and proportionality. So uh, this is just a plug for one particular paper where we also looked at uh, multi-winner voting from a fairness point of view. And one last application domain, which is quite exciting, especially in social choice theory, is that of uh, participatory budgeting. And this is the uh, framework in which uh, a lot of big towns, cities, uh, provinces, they distribute a lot of their funds or they make a lot of funding decisions about which public projects they need to choose uh, by asking the residents about what they prefer. So it's very similar to multi-winner voting, but it has an additional ingredient that uh, these candidates or these projects have their own respective costs. And you also have a total budget that you wish to uh, respect. So this in fact was also uh, started last year uh, in NSW that people have been trying to come up with new methods uh, to select a set of projects which satisfy these demands. They respect the preferences of the residents uh, they also satisfy the budget limits. So uh, just to summarize, uh, just, just a very brief version of my longer talk, uh, in terms of recipes of some success stories in this space, uh, a lot of these problems are quite complex. So uh, resorting to simpler method spaces where uh, the, you make some assumptions about what kind of preferences uh, agents have is very important because otherwise, uh, agents in, in actual uh, life, they have uh, preferences over exponential number of bundles of items or exponential number of uh, outcomes. Uh, you might want to look at restricted preferences. And one thing which has really worked well in the space is a very typical computer science approach to problem solving, which is uh, considering relaxations and approximations of uh, target properties. So uh, one last slide. Uh, if you want to look at various problems, there are a lot of nice uh, ideas which are already underlying in uh, mathematical economics. Uh, these can be extended in various ways to these more realistic or more complex settings. Uh, I've mentioned quite a few uh, points here. These are all features which might come up with your, in, in your particular problem space. So just to uh, focus on fair allocation with money, uh, only a few months, months back, a couple of months back, there was a Nobel Prize which was given for uh, new work on uh, auction design, especially uh, auctions which generate a lot of revenue or a lot of generate a lot of uh, value when you're trying to make these decisions. Uh, on the other hand, uh, a lot of these decisions, they don't especially focus on issues such as diversity, fairness, and so on. So there's obviously a lot of work to be done where you might want to think about fairness concepts as well when you're making these large scale and very important decisions uh, worth billions of dollars. So I'll like to conclude at this point and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you, Harris. Um, we're actually running way behind schedule, so I think we're gonna have to skip the questions for now okay. and go straight to uh, Yao Hong's um, talk next. So we're gonna hear from one of our PhD students who's gonna tell us about um, a very concrete application of these sorts of ideas to um, school choice. So, now home. 
Okay. So, thank you very much for your introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Zhao Hong. Uh, today, I will give a presentation on mechanism design for school choice with the soft diversity constraints. This is a joint work with Harris Aziz and Serge Gaspers. Recently, there has been increased attention to the school choice problem that takes diversity concern into account. One typical example is Harvard admissions lawsuit. In 2014, a group called Students for Fair Admissions sued Harvard for discriminating against Asian Americans. Let's see what happened. And this figure is one of the court documents submitted by Howard. It describes the average CITES score for the admitted students by race from the year 2000 to 2017. Different colors represent different races. As you can see, Asian Americans had the highest average CITES score among all races. This figure describes admissions rate by race for the same period. Although Asian Americans had the highest average CITES score, they received the lowest admissions rate. You may, you may wonder whether this is fair. In the process of Howard admissions, multiple factors need to be taken into consideration, including the applicant's background, life experience, race, as well as academic performances. In October 2019, the federal judge ruled in favor of Howard that uh, its admissions policies are lawful. So we should not draw the conclusion that Howard discriminates against Asian Americans based on CITES scores only. Next, uh, let me briefly introduce the, the model of school choice. This is a classical two-sided matching problem involving a site of students and a site of schools. Each student has a preference ordering over schools, and each school has a priority ordering over students, as shown in the figure. The goal is to design an algorithm that matches students to schools while taking their preferences and the priorities into account. In the literature of school choice, three desirable properties are often considered. The first one is fairness which requires that the outcome should eliminate justified envy among students. The second property is non-wastefulness, which requires that the outcome should make efficient use of vacant school seats. The third property is strategy proofness, which requires that all students should truly submit their preferences. For the basic school choice model, there exists an algorithm called generalized deferred acceptance, which is a strategy proof for students and always outputs a fair and non-wasteful outcome. In real life, school admissions are often subject to diversity constraints. In this setting, students are associated with a set of types which are used to capture trends, such as being from a disadvantaged group or being extra talented. To achieve a racial, social, and economic balance, schools typically cite lower and upper cultures on each type. In this picture, we show an example of a school choice with diversity constraints. One thing I want to emphasize is that these bonds should be considered as hard cultures. Uh, should not be considered as hard cultures. Uh, here are several issues of citing hard bonds. Uh, firstly, there may not exist any feasible outcome that fulfills all minimum cultures. Secondly, two important uh, properties, fairness and non-wastefulness, are incompatible with each other. Thirdly, imposing hard upper cultures on majority students may be counterproductive, which means it may hurt the welfare of minority students. The fourth issue is related to computational complexity. It's NP hard to check the existence of a feasible outcome that satisfies fairness and non-wastefulness. Due to all these issues, recent literature treats diversity constraints as a soft bounds. In this paper, we show a, a general impossibility result that some natural fairness concept is incompatible with non-wastefulness even if each student has at most two types. In the, instead, we focus on a weaker concept called fairness for same types. As the name indicates, 
it requires that a feasible outcome should eliminate justified error among students who have the same set of types. Some existing work has considered the school choice problem with diversity constraints. One important issue in existing work is the imbalance of representation for certain type, type, uh, for certain type combinations. For example, the existing algorithms may achieve a reasonable representation of girls as well as aboriginals, but have zero representation of aboriginal girls. In contrast, we are trying to design an algorithm that achieves a balanced integration of students from diverse backgrounds, rather than just satisfying quotas of each type. Our key idea is to eliminate overlapping types by assigning each student one type combination. Although the number of type combinations could be exponential in the number of types, in real life, its number is relatively small, which means it's still a practical solution. Here is an example of type combinations. Suppose we have two types related to gender and athletics. Then we can create four type combinations so that each student has exactly one type combination. Next, let me give a high-level description of our new algorithm, generalized deferred acceptance for type combinations. First, we create a new set of type combinations, and then we cite coders for each type combination, and incorporate these induced coders into the choice function of schools. Finally, we employ the generalized deferred acceptance algorithm with the choice function of schools to determine the outcome. All these procedures consist of our new class of algorithms, GDATC. Note that there are different ways to establish coders for type combinations, and each different method specifies one particular algorithm of GDATC. For instance, we can invoke linear programming to divide coders for types into, type, into coders for type combinations. We compare our new proposed algorithm, GDATC, with two existing algorithms, DAOT and GDAPMA. We summarize the theoretical properties satisfied by each algorithm in this table. In conclusion, GDATC is a suitable alternative algorithm to GDAPMA and DAOT. It satisfies several important properties that GDAPMA does not, and it outperforms DAOT in terms of achieving diversity goals and returns a much more balanced outcome. So this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much for listening.